I realize that when you say America became Mississippi, it is a controversial subject, or it's a, it's a controversial um, assertion to make. And so I think I should start by saying something about the Mississippi into which I was born in 1956, in August of that year. I was born in a town named Indianola. Does anybody know the name of the town? Because if you do, there's a reason. Anybody other than Alex? Alex? Why? Yeah, it's B.B. King's hometown, the great, the great blues man. And if you draw a circle of about, you know, 30 miles in any direction around Indianola, you will take in the birthplaces of most of the great Delta blues men. So first off, uh, you know, an acknowledgement that um, the contributions that Mississippi has made to American art in the broadest sense, and I'm thinking specifically of literature and music, um, you would be hard pressed to find another region that has had a greater influence on American literary culture and on American music because frankly, if you take the blues out of country music or bluegrass or jazz or rock and roll, you don't have any music left. It all goes back to that. Um, so it's a, it's a tradition that I'm honored and proud to be a part of. There is another tradition in Mississippi that is much less laudable, and that is its political traditions. And that's mostly what I'm here to talk about today. So <clears throat> when I was born in Mississippi, it was a completely bifurcated society. There were blacks and there were whites. There was a small Asian community, but in the big scheme of things in Mississippi, they were presumed to be part of the white community. If you weren't black, that was the only thing that mattered. And so um, everything was separate. There were two separate societies that existed in close proximity to one another. Sometimes extreme wealth right across the road from dire poverty wasn't like it is in a lot of the country where the wealthy people don't see the poor people and the poor people don't see the wealthy people. Down there, we saw one another. So what I mean by, um, uh, you know, two separate societies. If you were black and you were walking in downtown Indianola on a Saturday afternoon and three white people came walking towards you on the sidewalk, it was understood that you stepped into the street or there would be repercussions. That's one thing. Uh, if you got sick and you went to the doctor's office, there were two waiting rooms. The one that I got to know well, it had nice, soft chairs, lots of them, lots of room. There were copies of the New Yorker magazine there. There were copies of Sports Illustrated. There were newspapers. There was a television set. When it was your turn to go to the doctor, the receptionist called Mrs. Yarbrough, Mr. Johnson. There was another waiting room around the corner. It was much smaller and crowded. There were no comfortable chairs. There were hard wooden benches, and there weren't even enough of those. There was no printed matter. There was no television set. And when it was your turn to, the doc to go to the doctor, the receptionist would call Mary Sue, Jimmy. Didn't matter how old you were. If you were 80 years old, you were not going to be giving the title Mr. or Ms. The water fountains at the grocery store, there was one for white people. There was one for black people. And just in case anybody got confused, because the assumption was that most of the black people couldn't read, and in fact, many of the white people couldn't read either. One of them was painted, guess what, white, and one of them was painted black. If you went to the wrong one, there would be repercussions. Um, I guess most importantly, the schools were completely separate. There were black schools, there were white schools. The white schools started at the normal time, around September 1st, 
and it went through until May. The black school opened usually around the middle of July, and it closed around the beginning of September. Anybody guess why? The cotton was in the fields, and the black kids were sent to the fields to pick the cotton with their parents. And then when there was no cotton left in the fields, the black schools would open up again. Um, that was the reality of the time and the place, and pretty much everybody accepted it for a long, long time. I neglected to mention that um, if you were black, of course, you couldn't go into the white restaurant to eat. If you were black, you couldn't stay in a hotel or a motel, which meant that, let's say, um, if, you, if you had a black couple or a black family traveling to, oh, uh, where, Arizona, from somewhere in Pennsylvania, well, first of all, they probably would do everything possible to avoid going into the South, but if they couldn't, if they needed to go visit family, they needed to have a copy of something called the Negro Motorist Green Book which would tell you where you might be able to find a place to eat or to sleep or to use the bathroom because, of course, if you were black, you couldn't go to the white bathroom. Um, something happened in 1954 that ultimately would change the landscape, and it wouldn't do it, it, wouldn't do it fast, but it would do it eventually. And that is that the U.S. Supreme Court issued a unanimous decision in a case called Brown versus Board of Education, which was actually filed in Topeka, Kansas, but most of the schools that were affected were in the South. And what that decision um, said was that separate but equal schools are unconstitutional. The schools were certainly separate, but they were never equal. Very often the black schools didn't even have textbooks. Now, you would think that um, a ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court would produce an immediate response. And it did. The most interesting of the immediate responses happened in my hometown. That court case came down at the end of May 1954 Six weeks later, at the beginning of July, 13 white men had a meeting in Indianola, Mississippi. Uh, I've seen the house where the meeting occurred, used to walk past it all the time. They formed an organization called the White Citizens Council. And the White Citizens Council um, was there to keep the societies, black society and white society, separate as long as they possibly could. And whatever else you could say about those 13 men, um, they were racist, um, they were bigoted, whatever name you want to put on it. Something they were not, unfortunately, was stupid. They understood that there was this new force in American life called television. And they understood that the KKK, everybody here knows about the KKK, right? How many of you had ever heard of the White Citizens Council? The White Citizens Council was ultimately many times more effective at enforcing the, the racist basis of that society than the KKK ever was. And the reason was that the KKK, which sometimes, by the way, worked in conjunction with the White Citizens Council. Um, the KKK knew basically one way to go. That was, you beat people, you shoot people, you burn churches, uh, you do all of those things. What, what the Citizens Council members understood was that when that stuff started showing up on television, the country was going to turn pretty quickly against what was called our southern way of life. You have to understand that our meant we whites. And so they decided, well, there's a more effective way to go about this because really everything, everything comes down to keeping people separate in the school system, 
Because if you let little kids start playing with one another and becoming friends, it's going to be harder and harder to make them accept the notion that the kid that they play with is the other. And everything depended on people understanding that and living by that code. So they wanted to keep the schools separate as long as they could. And they also understood that in a town like mine, which um, in 1954 was about 66% black. Process that for a second. 66% of the population is black, but they control nothing. They don't control anything because they can't vote. Even though the law of the land says you can vote, in practice, they couldn't vote. And what the Citizens Council wanted to do was make sure that that continued to be the case. Um, I should say that my father was not one of the first 13 men, but he was one of what's referred to as the second 71. So the second meeting, my father was part of the council. My dad died in 2017, and the day he died, he had a Citizens Council card, old and freighted and fade, faded, in his back pocket. He was never ashamed of it. It didn't bother him at all. Um, and so um, here's how they decided to practice economic repression, believing that this would be much more effective than all of those images of violence. And, and this is the way it would work. So let's say you had a guy like my father, who's a small farmer. He doesn't even own any land. I mean, he's, by any definition, he's poor himself. Um, he has three black families living in houses on the land that he rents and farms. So when people begin to talk about voting rights, which started happening in the 1950s, Let's say that one of those men, and maybe the man and the wife, um, who work for my father, they go down to the courthouse and attempt to register to vote. Now, first of all, they're not going to be successful. And the reason they're not going to be successful is that the county registrar, when confronted with a black person who wants to vote, will say, okay, I need you to recite the first four paragraphs of the U.S. Constitution. Um, if you'd ask probably any white person in town to recite the first four paragraphs of the U.S. Constitution, they couldn't have come close. But they didn't get asked. Um, but the mere fact that that man went to try to register to vote, it predicated what would happen next. What would happen next is the county registrar would call my father and he'll say, John, um, Thomas Burns came down and tried to register to vote the other day. You know what you got to do. So what my father would do is he would go to Thomas Burns' house and he would say, Tom, you tried to register to vote. I want you all out of here. You got 25, uh, 24 hours to get off my farm. You're gone. And then, of course, you're Thomas Burns and his family. You need a place to live. But by the time you start looking for one, guess what my father has done? He's picked up the phone and he started calling other farmers and he said, listen, uh, you know, uh, Tommy, Tommy might come to you wanting a place to live and wanting to work for you and he, you need to know he tried to register to vote. It really worked wonderfully well because when that man went to try to get another job, no local farmer was going to hire him. Best case is he goes somewhere else in Mississippi, but he's probably not skilled at doing anything but farm work, and the Delta is where all of the agriculture um, is based in the Delta, and so essentially uh, he's got to go somewhere else. He can't stay there. He's not going to vote. That's what it comes down to. And so um, the Citizens Council managed to keep a chokehold on economic life in the Mississippi Delta and, on, and ultimately what happened to blacks until well into the 1960s. And they also became very effective elsewhere in the South. In Mississippi, the schools began to integrate 
within a few years. Um, it happened down on the Gulf Coast. It happened some in Jackson. Um, but where it never happened was the Mississippi Delta. The Mississippi Delta, uh, 13 counties in the Delta are anywhere from 53 to 75 percent black. So that's where, you know, that's where it worked better than it did anywhere else. Um, in 1955, one day, uh, one year and one day before I was born, and about 20 miles away from where I was born, a young black man from Chicago came down south um, to visit his mother's relatives. His name was Emmett Till. He was 14 years old. And Emmett Till and a friend went to a country store where there was a white woman named Caroline Bryant working behind the cash register. And nobody really knows what happened because nobody else was in there except Emmett Till and Caroline Bryant. Caroline Bryant, who died about 10 days ago, by the way, in her mid-80s, um, under the name Caroline Bryant Dunham. Um, Caroline Bryant said that he touched her, he grabbed her hand, uh, he said, what's the matter, baby? You can't take it. Uh, she changed that story later on. To make a long story short, she, um, her husband and his brother abducted Emmett Till, and they murdered him after torturing him, and they threw his body into the Tallahatchie River. And this set off a national storm. Bryant and J.W. Milam, his brother-in-law, um, were acquitted some months later by an all-white jury. They deliberated something like 45 minutes, and they said it would have been much faster, but they took a break to drink a Coke. They found both of them not guilty. And then some months later, the two men sold their story to Look Magazine, admitting that they had murdered him, but that he had it coming. And as you can imagine, this appalled the country. And a whole series of things happened over the next few years that appalled the country. One of them was that in 1962 at the University of Mississippi, um, a black man who had been in the, the military and served his country, he applied for admission to the school. And there were a bunch of court cases. And um, the courts ruled that he had the right to enroll at the school. What happened? over the next few weeks was that the, the racist fervor just picked up. It went on to steroids. And when he went to enroll at the school, there was a riot. Uh, two people were killed. 27 law officers were seriously wounded. Parts of the town were set on fire. Um, and the insurrection, because that's what it was, it took on so much power that eventually JFK had to nationalize the Mississippi National Guard and send 30,000 troops into Oxford to keep the peace. That was a major inflection point. The following year, the civil rights leader, Medgar Evers, is murdered in his driveway in Jackson, Mississippi. Then there's the murder of JFK. In 1964, Freedom Summer, uh, three civil rights workers were murdered near Philadelphia, Mississippi. And this was, again, the catalyst for the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which had been crafted by JFK, but it was passed by LBJ after the murder of JFK. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act passes. Um, what the Civil Rights Act did was it made it illegal to restrict public accommodations on the basis of race. It was a big deal. By the way, um, the swimming pool in my, in my hometown, and this is, it happened all over the South, when they realized they weren't going to be able to legally keep blacks out of it anymore, you know what they did? They brought out a concrete mixer and they filled it up, and then nobody could go swimming. Um, the Voting Rights Act, in 1965, that was the big one. That was the big one. Because then, people were going to register to vote. When the county registrars tried the same old stuff that they had always done, it didn't work anymore. 
the county registrar, some of them went to jail. Um, and, you know, the bottom line is that though, um, though the schools remain separate in parts of the South, as in my hometown, they opened up an all-white school, a private school, and then the public schools took the black kids, but they were all black. There were no white kids there. Would you believe that in my hometown right now, there are few white kids in the public school. Um, in 50-something years, there have been eight black students at the white private school. All of them were athletes, and nobody lasted longer than a year. Still right there. The town today is 80% black. What has changed is that black people now control the municipal administration because they can vote. So the Voting Rights Act was a big deal. And um, I'm not going to say that, that, you know, things were all wonderful in Mississippi or throughout the South. They've never been. They've never been equal. But we begin to see a degree of justice. So I, I would argue that at that moment, um, when all of these things happened, America certainly was not like Mississippi. It saw what was going on, and it responded, and it made a difference. So when did things take a turn for the worse? A particular politician in 1980, when running for president, gave a campaign speech at the Neshoba County Fair right outside Philadelphia, Mississippi, about three miles from where those three civil rights workers had been murdered in 1964. Here's a paragraph from the speech. I believe in states' rights. I believe in people doing as much as they can for themselves at the community level and at the private level. And I believe that we've distorted the balance of our government today by giving powers that were never intended in the Constitution to that federal establishment. And if I do get the job I'm looking for, I'm going to devote myself to trying to reorder those priorities and to restore to the states and local communities those functions which properly belong there. Anybody know who that was? Ronald Reagan. Um, and one of the most important things Reagan did as president was that he named William Rehnquist Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. And when William Rehnquist was a young lawyer in Arizona, he had worked and a voter suppression organization for the GOP. What's changed over the last 20, 25, 30, 40 years, we're seeing play out now in the US Supreme Court. Um, things have gone in a very different direction. And I'll be the first to say that in 2008, the night Barack Obama was elected president, I thought we were entering a glorious new age. Um, and my wife could tell you the party we had that night, you know, the champagne was flowing and I was crying. And, um, and by, by the way, a black friend of mine, um, a novelist who I was working with at that time named David Anthony Durham, he was standing there with me. And, you know, I'm crying, and David put his arm around me, and he said, Steve, you know, I think I've always had more faith in white people than you have. Um, I resisted the urge in 2016 to call him and say, hey, David, what do you think? In 2013, the Voting Rights Act was gutted by the U.S. Supreme Court in the Shelby County versus Holder case. And now, of course, there are constant efforts to suppress voting. How dangerous are those efforts? Joe Biden won the popular election, the popular vote, in 2020 by 7,060,000 votes. Sounds great. If he had gotten 12,000 fewer votes in Georgia, 
11,000 fewer votes in Arizona, 80,000 fewer votes in Pennsylvania, and 155,000 fewer votes in Michigan. Rather than winning the Electoral College 306 to 232, he loses it 295 to 243. Still wins the popular vote by 6.8 million votes and loses the presidency. I think what we've become aware of, and it's always been there, and, and, and let's also acknowledge that for much of American history, it frequently worked to the, you know, to the benefits of the Democrats. So it could go either way. Um, that's the way it's going now. And if you remember, um, I said that, that for, the, for the people who like to run things to continue to run them in Mississippi the way they wanted to, they needed to suppress the vote. If everybody who could vote voted, things were going to change. Things did change. What do you do um, if the suppression of the vote doesn't work in the ordinary ways? Well, there's always violence and there's always intimidation. Um, a number of books have come out in the U.S. in the last three or four years, and though it's probably not, well, it's definitely not been good for my mental health. I think I've read all of them. The two that um, I think have said it most forcefully, where, the, where they think we are in the U.S., is actually one of the writers is a Canadian. He's a novelist um, and journalist named Stephen Marche. I think I'm, I, it's M-A-R-C-H-E. I think I'm pronouncing it right. The title of the book is The Next Civil War. And um, the other book is by Jeff Charlotte. I just read it finished it after I got to Krakow. It's called The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. And what both of them argue is, um, you know, it's the nature of, you know, humans to, when they think of war, they think of whatever the last one was. But often the next war doesn't look like the last war. So when people think of civil war in the U.S., I, you know, if, if, if by civil war we mean when you, one group of people in blue, blue uniforms firing at another group of people in gray uniforms, that's not what it's going to be. That's not what's happening. What they both argue is that what is happening is the term that they use is stochastic terrorism, which means there are constant acts of terror being perpetrated daily, and you can't say where they're coming from. How much terror? Last year in the U.S., 647 mass shootings. Of those, 21 involved five or more fatalities. 312 children were killed in mass murders last year. This year, as of early May, the Gun Violence Archive has counted more than 192 mass shootings in the United States. Um, so, it, if you remember that, that incident at Ole Miss that I began by talking about in 1962 where this, all the riots happened and the law officers were wounded and people died and cars got turned over and there was just, just a real insurrection. Can you imagine what recent event in American history it made me have a little flashback to that point? January 6, 2021, um, I'd stayed up all night the night before to find out if the Democrats would gain control of the Georgia Senate seats. And, you know, they did, uh, partly because <laughs> the outgoing president had gone down there and convinced everybody that all oh, the elections are rigged, so why vote? And that's the main reason the Democrats won, because if all the Republicans had voted, they wouldn't have won. Um, so I took a nap, and I woke up, and I went and turned the television on. 
and I saw people assaulting the capital of the United States. And when I saw it, you know, my wife could tell you, I've been telling her for years that's how it was going to end. And I said it to people who would just say, Steve, you get your, I don't know what, I don't know where you're coming from. I don't know what's happening to you. You know that's not going to happen here. It did. Um, and so the, you know, the assertion um, that I'm seeing a lot of things in the country at large that I feel like I saw on a smaller scale in Mississippi, that's what I mean. Um, there was a day, and I live just some distance north of Boston, and there was a day last April at the time when uh, high school kids have graduation parties. Evan and I were taking a walk not far away from where we live, and a gust of wind hit a flag in front of this house. And I said, did I, did I see? And then the, the wind hit it again. It was a flag that had the U.S. flag on one side, and on the other side it had the Confederate battle flag. Six miles north of Boston, true blue Massachusetts. Um, I went home and found it on a right-wing website called Rebel Nation. It was being sold for $50 or something like that. So my feeling is um, what worries me is that the way, I th the way things are going in the country right now, you won't solve the problems by subduing a region because it's neighborhood to neighborhood, sometimes it's house to house. Um, and, you know, I'm not a church-going person, I do have two adult daughters, um, and every morning and every night, uh, first thing in the morning, last, name, last thing at night, please don't let there be a mass killing today. Please protect everybody's children. The effect of this constant bombardment of this madness on a daily basis, I feel like it's doing something to the national soul. I, kn I know that it's doing something to mine, and <laughs> I've had, you know, I've had people ask me, um, well, what you... well, you know, we have problems in Poland, too, and I'm aware of those problems, but there's something you don't have here. Um, you don't have an armed populace. 350 million people in the U.S., 415 million firearms in private hands, and though I will always vote for gun control, I, it's gotten to the point now where I'm very, very leery about whether or not it can be, really be effective, because let's face it, you want to build an AR-15, which is the weapons being used in many, if, if not all, of the mass shootings lately, 3D printer will do the trick. So, um, I know this is not, you know, this is, this is not great news to process, um, but Mihal asked me to talk about something that was on my mind, and that's on my mind.